Boom. All right, bro. So uh, in the previous episode, we discussed, you know, uh, kung madre Espanya ang tawag natin sa Amerika. Kuya, <laughs> ano, uh, Uncle Sam, Kuya, ano, Tito, Tito Sam. Tito Sam, all right. Napag- <laughs> napag-usapan natin si Tito Sam. Ikaw, ano naisip mo? <laughs> ano pang asal mo? Well, Tito Sam, pero parang Kuya US and then, and then uh, yung Japan in Japan di ba Diko yung second older brother na hindi natin ginagamit yung yes. Diko oh or, yeah, yeah. Or, like the middle Diko, yeah, that's Diko, Chinese. Diko, Diko yeah, Japan yeah. Oh. major major Chinese influence now before we go to Japan let's talk about China because China is the other superpower these days in fact um I my view on China US is partly influenced actually by the works of Adam too who happens to be one of her favorite uh, persons out there in fact I didn't know there's an uh two's bros but Bernie Bros club out there so apparently he has so many followers suddenly like, I I don't want to be part of these people I'm sorry no but but one of the things he said in a piece on London uh, in London Review the other year because I think during pandemic he was very prolific and he said some very original things in, a, in addition to his book though, on on the COVID post-COVID world etc he said something like if you look at it the Cold War was really a misnomer in many ways because fundamentally the Soviet Union was never really a peer right I mean, the economy of Soviet Union was, was barely comparable to that of Europe. Forget about bringing U.S. and Japan. So taking off from that point, my argument actually is the real Cold War is now between U.S. and China because China is really yeah. only, right, country that comes closest to being almost a peer of U.S. in terms of its continental sites, in terms of its resources. Yes, it's poorer, but it's making up because of its larger population. And technologically, bro, di ba, nakakatakot? I mean, look at how fast TikTok caught up. Look at how China is dominating the electric vehicle. So I was very excited to get a Tesla, right? I was really saving for it and all of that. And then when I got to know China controls 85% of supply of EV, and I got to read the ball. Ikaw may Tesla, may Tesla ka? No, no, Tesla I was really ako. going for that, right? And then I decided for something <laughs> else. You can you can go for Tesla for the yeah, longest Yeah, I was really going for that. I said, I really work hard and save for that. And then suddenly I read about this, but hmm, I'm not sure I want to go for Tesla, right? <laughs> not to mention Elon Musk is extremely annoying on Twitter, right? Oh, so so Sobran turn off now. I, I lost whatever passion I had for Tesla two, just two, three years ago when I was in California. But no, going back to this, I all this, the Chinese are dominating everything, right? In the cutting edge industries, in artificial intelligence, because they have no privacy laws. So they can bring in so many data mm-hmm. to help with machine learning. So if you have spent some time in China, have you been in China recently? Because, you know, I remember, bro, back in 2014, 15, 16, I was in China. They were already using QR code, like old people in huh? Tsinghua, just outside Tsinghua. So we were there. I think CJ Batumbakal Pangasawa, like, like uh, we had a talk there. I'd go there and then we're like the only idiots with currencies. Everyone else was using, using QR code. It's like, ano yung, ano na, yung, ano, yung chat, yung chat, yung ginagamit nila, diba? Yung, uh, yung oh, chat yeah, yeah, WeChat. WeChat. Oh, yeah, and they have this WeChat, which is Facebook, TikTok, uh, I mean, like, Instagram, like, everything, MasterCard, everything. So they were like, I just realized then palang, wow, China is leaping ahead of everyone else, you know? I, I saw things in China that I didn't see in Japan or even Korea, right? Some of the more interesting dynamic country. So I was really fascinated how China's guys... So if you look at it, for me, this is now the real Cold War. The one between US and China. Mm. Japan, because China can really match US, especially if China just focuses on the Pacific region. Because US is global empire, right? So sobrang... Right. Global, uh, right? So you're right. If you put head-to-head, US is still ahead. But if you put head-to-head only in the Indo-Pacific and our region, actually, my laban ng China... And by some accounts, China actually now already has the military edge until 2025, 2026. That's why you had that memo by this American Air Force guy that they said by 2025, 2025, there'll be an invasion of Taiwan, blah, blah. Anyway, we don't want to go into that. All I'm saying, bro, is China. we cannot talk about U.S. or Philippine-U.S. relations without talking about China. It's a triangular mm-hmm. relationship. I'm not sure it's a manager. Uh, in, is, I don't, I, I'm not sure it's a kind of a threesome relationship per se, but it's definitely an important strategic triangle. So with that very long introduction I made, right, just to say mahalaga rin ang China, what is the secret history of relationship of Philippines and China? What are the myths here that we have to get rid of? So obviously the myths we're going to talk about are all the xenophobic myths that we have to get rid of. But I want to talk about the other side of the myth because we have a lot of Chinese friends or pro-China friends who say, you don't know, look at the history of China. They were always very nice to us. And, you know, we never had conflict, etc. But we also have, diba, yung sino yung pirate na 
Lima Hong ba yan? Sino yan? <laughs> exactly, di ba? Oh. Play the game like that. Well, the Chinese attack. But obviously, you can you can come back and say, well, back then, there was not really a notion of China as a nation, right? So, you know, Lima Hong was just some, I don't know, Fujian guy, whatever, who came here. Uh-huh. We also have this history, right? Some of the Chinese pirates here came from with, with Japanese samurai. Like, uh, like you know, like Ronins. Like, even like, it gets crazy. Like, so speaking of secret history, let's go way back, bro. Like 500, 600 years ago, or even pre-Hispanic. What was the state of affairs between us and China? Or were we just their proxy or little brother? What was going on there? As a historian, what do you know about it? Or what well, are you interested well, to know about well, of it? Course yung, well, of course, yung buong Southeast Asia, certain parts of Southeast Asia had tributary re- relations right. with China. Of course, yeah. it's more pronounced yeah. with other pro- polities at that time. For example, of course, Vietnam. And Vietnam would was would really copy the yeah. Confucian traditions of China including including the bureaucracy that was never the case with us of course because of course our, our world was less that world and our world was more you know island southeast asia Santa. um yeah. yeah pero speaking of the philippines china and the world i mean we were the gateway from so so when did globalization start global trade according to the historian uh, historians dennis flynn and arturo heraldes it actually began Galleon in the trade. philippines Galleon Galleon trade Yeah. And, and their reasoning for that is prior to that all of the all of the continents of the world were connected through trade except for the Americas and Asia there was no ah, I get yeah yeah the, the trans so, so the moment the moment you connected that effectively all of the continents of the world were trading with each other already so so they their argument is that globalization began in 1571 with the inauguration of the Galleon trade now that meant that products from Asia were going into Europe, uh, were going to the Americas, and then uh, eventually they went into Europe. Right, right, Filipinos, right. actually, we were the way station, but what we weren't really trading much. They didn't really want a lot Contra of stuff. Contrapot, I think, is the political correct. Yeah. Right? I don't want to they, use they, they, may have wanted, they may have wanted spices from Southeast Asia. You know, so this, the, the spice trade was very important. Right. But ultimately, the Galleon trade was about bringing in American silver into Asia. Correct, correct, correct. And then the Europeans taking in Chinese products, affecting the Chinese products. That, that was one of the biggest market. So you, so if if you like, uh, you can make the argument that China's trading entry into the Americas and into global trade was actually birthed in the Philippines. Um, What was that? We brought out then, bro. That's it. Oh. The first one, like global history, Philippines and global. That's that's mm. a very good observation. I, I agree with that. Actually, I agree with that. I'm glad that you raised this point. Okay, so Galleon trade, we connect Americas to China, right? The two uh, global, you know, hubs of production, right? And we're like the Singapore between them. Yeah, yeah. And then and then of course we know how important that Pacific. Tayo yung nagpasimul, tayo yung nagpauso niyang Pacific trade na yan, di ba? And okay. we know how important that Pacific trade is today. That might be the like the most important trading route today, especially because the Ameri- America hasn't really This disentangled itself from Chinese production practices, no, no, no. and that's one of their biggest vulnerabilities. That's one of their biggest vulnerabilities, de right? Um, and so when when you think about it in those terms, in global terms, that's one thing I want to say in terms of history. Um, but as a kind of conceptual background, also, kailan talaga natin disentangle yung Chinese people from Chinese from the Chinese state? Um, okay, let's do that. That's very important. Yung, action talaga natin with Chinese people has, has been rich and deep and, be- and, and and quite beautiful, right? So no matter what this Chinese state does to us, the beauty for interaction with Chinese people and yung, yung, yung presence of Chinese culture in our society is undeniable and, and, and it's beautiful. I mean, if you think about somebody like Jose Rizal, I mean, they call him the pride of the Malayan race. I mean, come on, he was a Chinese, Chinese mestizo, right? So if the very founder of our country has Chinese blood, Then we should really, we should really forget about this this xenophobia. It looks very chinito, no? There's this wax oh. that's super chinito, as it almost like taka savior. I mean, like I don't, I live not too far away from. Say, like, wait lang, pag nakita ko yan, di ba? Ito yung mga Stephen, Stephen Tan yung mga ganyan, di ba? Yung mga savior, super matalino, mabait, di ba? You know? oh. I am sorry. I I, know, I I hope I didn't sound. I mean, I'm giving a compliment, right? Ito yung mga nasa school of econ sa UP and BAA. Yung mga ganon like. He looks super chinito. Actually, hindi siya moreno. Uh, he was more chinito. Um, and I asked Ambeth, uh, I said, well, lang, is this is this wax accurate? Because it's actually super chinito, not moreno, Filipino, so-called. Hindi. 
So I don't know. What do you know? I mean, you see, like, as chinitos, uh, I don't know if you you go, like, put Rizal, wax something, lalabas yan, eh. Makikita mo yun on Google. I was fascinated by that. The, the reason, of course, why, you know, the reason, of course, why nakalimutan natin na Chinese siya is because during the late 19th century, for tax purposes, it was just better to identify as, you know, simply yeah, Indo. Mercado, and, of course, it becomes part of you kind of yung nationalist idea na, you know, Los Indios Bravos. Pero, of course, Chinese, Chinese yung, Chinese yung heritage, right? So, and then, you know, like you, I mean, I'm sure if you look, if you did a DNA test, like you'll be surprised at how Chinese a lot of us are. Like uh, I, I mean, I mean, I myself did a DNA test. I'm like close to 25, like, like I'm close to a fourth Chinese, right? I, I, I don't know where it comes from. I mean, it's just part of, of, of who we are. As a as a society, um. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know where you wanna. Uh, I don't know. How, that's a, that's as far back as you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, like, the first thing I want to say is that there yeah. was no conception of China as China until recently. So our good, my good friend Bill Hayton has this new book called you know the invention of China. Right, the understanding right. China as a nation state is a very much a response to European colonialism. Right, before that, people in Fujian. If they're super diverse themselves, right? Had their own idea. Like there was, there was no idea that me and Fujian have the same kind of nation, whatever. It was a vague notion of common civilization in the same way, let's say, an Arab and Turk and Persian felt they were part of an uh, Islamic Ummah, right? I mean, you get what I'm saying, right? Or people of former Roman Empire kind of felt they were part of a kind of. A, but it it was never like you. Exactly, but even the idea of Philippines, Philippine nationalism, is a modern concept. So you cannot say. So obviously, when we talk about China today, we're talking about a massive super state that mm. is controlled by a communist party, which is completely beyond democratic processes. In fact, it doesn't have even a legal existence. So you cannot sue the Communist Party of China. There's no such thing as Communist Party, you know, it, it, on paper, right? So you cannot sue them in the Supreme oh. Court and say they violate our human. They literally operate above the law, literally, right? <laughs> like they're above the constitution of China. So you cannot sue them. So this is what we're talking about when we say this is the competition to yes. We're talking about a China ruled by the Communist Party. But speaking of people of, let's say, scenic Chinese heritage, right? I mean, it really is starts with commercial relationship. And we have the oldest Chinatown in the world, right? They want to be known as the oldest we know, right? Anywhere in the world. So it's really ancient uh, connection, right? And special. Yeah, it, it is special. And you know, important yung, yung regional quality of Chinese-ness, right? Um, our Chinois are mostly, yeah. speaking, are mostly from southern China, and that 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 of course has its own set of politics. But also the beautiful thing about the Chinese community in the Philippines, this kind of Hokkien world, is that it connects us to the rest of Southeast Asia and it connects our history to Southeast Asia. Because what does Southeast Asia have in common from have in common? It has this history of Hokkien traders. Moving right. in and out of these countries and, and trading with each and, and trading with each other and eventually integrating in, into these into these particular societies. So, the, the Chinese um, gives us a, a special identity as Filipinos because right. that interaction creates something beautiful. But the Chinese and the history of Chinese migration into the Philippines also gives us something in common with our Southeast Asian neighbors. If you you know if you talk to Indonesian Chinese, they're very similar to. Our, Chinois because they're they're also they also have family from southern China right they're all also Hokkien speaking and so it makes us you know the Chinese makes us make us part of a regional history yeah so speaking of remember we talked about re, uh, regionalism or regionalization of the you know the three waves no uh, in the, in the previous episode we we talked about how Britain was central to financial regionalization in in the region with the silver. Uh, you know, standard of, of trade and then we, the Americans come, the Japanese come. So actually you can go even earlier and say the Chinese, especially Hokkien Chinese or Southern Chinese, Cantonese Chinese, yeah. Chinese, Chinese, they were central to the first kind of a truly regional economic integration, no? Uh, because you'll see them all over the all over the area, right? Especially in Nusantara, South Asia, right? So mm. Malay, Malay, Bahasa was the language of trade, right? Mm. While vectors of commercialization, a lot of them were people of Chinese heritage, although there was no Chinese nation state back then. In fact, ironically, a lot of this was happening during the Manchu uh, mm. era time. Where, you know, and in fact, non non Hans were in rule, uh, ruling China back oh. then. So that's also the other thing we keep on forgetting, right? Like this is this yeah. is no longer Ming Dynasty we're talking about, right? This is this is the Qing Dynasty we're talking about, which is a Manchu Dynasty. Now, speaking of that, also now we also know that the othering project. 
because our ties with the Chinese uh, people of Chinese heritage is very deep, they had already a significant commercial and cultural presence in the Philippines. We also, uh, and but that, that also meant that the othering of Chinese, people of Chinese heritage, also goes deep in the Philippines, right? With the Spanish coming in, kind of ghettoizing them, right? I mean, right. and of yeah. course, this whole thing of we're Catholic, et cetera, and they're heathens, et cetera. So clearly, the Spanish colonialism had an influence, right, in terms of our othering of the Chinese, right? Oh, Chinese are not one of us, or Chinese are this and this and that, right? I mean, I, I'm sure it's Spain played a big role in the prejudices that we still have against our Chinese brothers, or Chinoy yeah. brothers, here for that Yeah, yeah, so so colonialism as a whole, diba? So let's yeah. talk about our two colonial powers. Of course, yung Chinese ghettoized through yung parian, and of course, right. merong periodic expulsions and periodic acts of violence against the Chinese uh, sa parian and systemic discrimination. Um, there's a great film that people should watch yung ganito kami noon, paano kayo ngayon? And, and uh, you can see uh, partly yung treatment of the Chinese in the right. late 19th century and how, you know, Ch the, many Chinese, despite that, you know, still identified with some kind of incipient proto-nationalism in the Philippines. Right. It's, Interesting. It's, you know, and then, and then of course, yung Americas, uh, yung America pagdating nila, they had the Chinese Exclusion Act, di ba? So, bawal pumasok ang California, Chinese. California, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, the Supreme Court of the, well, the I don't know if it was the Supreme Court case, but the legal minds of the U.S. decided that since the Philippines was now part of the U.S., U.S. law applied. So, there was a yeah, Chinese Exclusion uh, Act well. So, yung, yung, yung discrimination natin against the Chinese um, is really birthed in but was really birthed by colonialism. And our, but, but in contrast to that, our affinity with Chinese nationalism circumvented colonial practice. So one of the great friendships in Asian history that I like, and mm -hmm. Professor Maharis talks about this a lot, is the intimate friendship between Mariano Ponce, the Ilustrado, right. Right. Sun Yat-sen, right. Sun Yat-sen, of course, learned In everything. Hawaii? Is this in Hawaii? Yeah. In, in, Yoko, in Yokohama. Yokohama. Yokohama, sorry, yeah, in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, and Sun Yat-sen really learned a lot about the history of the Philippine Revolution and Philippine nationalism via his friend Ponce. And in fact, Ponce died on a ship trying to visit Sun Yat-sen. Wow, that's how, yeah. That kind of intimate relationship. And uh, via Sun Yat-sen, many of the texts of the Philippine Revolution, many of the texts of Philippine nationalism were eventually translated into Chinese. And that became a part of right. Chinese nationalism. And we're saying, you know, in this in, the, in this agitation against the Manchu dynasty that would eventually right. result, of course, in, in, in the formation. 1911, of, yeah, yeah. The, 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 yeah, in, China. In, in the formation of um, the, the Kuomintang. Um, so, there's really a history. Illustrado uh, Kuomintang uh, connection, right? I mean, uh, people, yes. I mean, writers uh, like uh, Pankaj Mishra, right? Uh, you know, on the ruins of empire, writes very much about the influence of the Philippines on nationalist movement, including in China, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, Liang so three, Chao, three, even three, before three, Sun Yat-sen, there was Liang Qichao and other kind of more secular modernist nationalists in China. That's that's that's, that's fascinating. So now, yeah, the three authors that uh, one, yeah. so Tama, si Pankaj Mishra, and then of course si Professor Rizin Moharis, and then right, our friend Sinu Kunying Avoitis who wrote that, that great book right, on right. nationalism in the Philippines and yung networks ng Japanese, um, Chinese, and Filipino nationalists. I have yeah. to read that. I saw very good, very good uh, reviews of that. So I. The, are you good friends or something? I, I, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that should be fascinating. Now, let's move a little bit forward. So, of course, China itself will be, you know, uh, splintered by a very bloody civil war that goes hand in hand with a very brutal Japanese occupation. That's another thing that we have in common with uh, mm. China is both of us were really at the forefront of imperial Japanese maximum brutality, right? So the, you have the Nanking Massacre there. Uh, and then in the case of Philippines, of course, I mean, you know, my grandmother, you know, they were they were part Chinese, Ilocano, so they were really badly targeted during the Imperial Japanese era. And she can still recite the Imperial Japanese music and how she saved her, you know, parents from being buried alive. You know, so so we a lot of us have loved ones who can recite to us the brutality of the Japanese uh imperial regime back then. Um, but going back to this, so China gets splintered. Uh, you know, at some point, Gomintang and 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 communists have to have a kind of a united front. Zhao and uh, you know, Zhou and Lai tries to negotiate that. It kind of works for a while, but eventually, of course, as the Japanese withdraw, a lot of beating was taken by Gomintang, so that benefits the communists, right? I mean, I don't know if you agree with that, but that's that's really the 
a lot of uh, what recent history is showing that one reason the communists won that civil war is precisely because the Kuomintang did more of the brutal, because they had the conventional capabilities to fight the Japanese and all. And there were tactical races. But eventually, the, the communists come on top. The Kuomintang will be pushed to Taiwan. So that had an effect on Filipinos here, right? Because there were a lot of Filipinos. I, I know even the schools in my area, because I'm in San Juan area. Okay, are shake. Oh. like pro, but on Taiwanese, right? Kuomintang mm -hmm. kind of Chinese. And then now you'll see more mainland Chinese. Like that's that's why I said, like when we talk about Chinois, we forget that there's these huge divisions, right? Yeah. Uh, political, yeah. ideological, and, and cultural divisions that that, that we there, tend there, to there's a, there's a, there's a book that the uh, that, that just came out actually about you know divisions on Chinese community during this period about right. people who were loyal to the Communist Party and, uh, and about you know, emergent anti-communist Chinese Filipino politics of Philippines. It's because a lot of the schools were actually really close to the Kuomintang in, in exactly. Taiwan. Inside, yeah. and so so for example, I mean Savior School you mentioned Savior School uh, was actually initially not run by the Philippine province of the Society of Jesus. It was run by the the Chinese province of the Society of Jesus, which was effectively an Taiwan. exiled province, exiled yeah. from the communists, so effectively from Taiwan. And then you have, um, you know, um, schools that are explicitly loyal to the the Kuomintang by virtue of their name, like Chiang Kai Shek School, de ba? Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. You can see that it's pretty it's open. Yeah. Of of of, um, of 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 the Kuomintang. So so a lot of those politics, a lot of the Chinese politics uh, are playing out in Southeast Asia because a lot of those politics are also a politics of exile and diaspora. And so that's a lot of those debates are happening. The Philippines are also happening in, in Taiwan. It, it's it's a very interesting history, which you know I I, I have to admit I, I need to learn more about this particular history. Yeah. So that's one of my goals. after and, I start. Of course, I, you know I was based in Taiwan. About yeah. 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 Garcia. No, no, I, I, that's that's what makes our our, our our podcast really crazy, right? No, I mean, what I also notice is, sorry, people always talk about mm, our our anti-China prejudices, whatever. But I, I'm sorry, I noticed that Filipinos were super. You know, we we have very positive uh, views of Singapore, which is Chinese majority, and also Taiwan, right? So you know, so clearly uh, this is not racialist per se, right? Because our, our perceptions of Taiwan and Singapore is very different from our perception of China. And all of them are Chinese majority, right? I mean, in terms yeah. of ethnic and, and, and well, oh my. You know, call, you, have you noticed that, right? Like, if they say, Ang Pinay, racist, such a, but no, but we really love Taiwan. We really love Singapore. So, oh can more, more to this, right? We have, a, we have a kind of we have a kind of admiration of certain forms of Chinese modernity. Parang <laughs> <laughs> East right, Asian. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So so I mean that's that's something or probably Philippines would always like Shanghai more than Beijing. I don't know. I mean uh, <laughs> I always hear very good things Filipinos say about Shanghai, not as much about Beijing. Yeah. You know? So I maybe it's something else I wanna look at. Obviously, our relationship with Fujian is different because a lot of our friends have ancestors there or founder ancestors there. I think Rizal's monument can be found in one of the villages in Fujian, right? Uh, where his Chinese ancestor, the Mercado side, come from, right? So speaking of the Malayan hero, right? And then, of course, yung, ano, yung kind of reclaiming din of Chineseness on the part of our national leaders. Of course, si Kore Aquino, pumunta yan sa, sa China talaga and then like kind of retrace her own roots as a, as a Chinese Filipino or Chinese mestizo, mestiza herself. So so, yeah. that, so so that's part of it. I have to make an admission. You talk about all these Chinese cities. I've never I've never been to mainland China. I, 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 you have to from visit, a, bro. Okay. Yeah. From a, behave. Be there's, nice. There's a, episode. So you get visa. There's a reason why. Pero <laughs> akong thinking na actually meron akong personal boycott of the People's Republic of China. Like I just don't want to visit our imperial our potential imperialists. So like there I really want to see Russia and China. Pero meron akong sense of politics na I don't want to spend money in those part in those two yeah, countries. I certainly feel that about Russia because Russia is one of my favorite countries. No, but after invasion of Ukraine, in fact, even the first invasion of Ukraine 24, I suddenly feel different. You know, I had a hard time because I Russia is one country I You could see all the Torganev and Tolstoy, everything behind me, no? Um, so I can't understand where you're coming from. No. Oh yeah, I love Russian. Uh, I mean, there's like Richard Haydarian before he read. All of these thousands of pages of the idiot. Forget about the brother Karamazov and all of that. I read all of the other ones that, like for instance, Demon. I mean, the things that people don't read. I read all the Dostoevsky and Torgenevs and everything I could find. Like I was obsessed with Russian because it helped me to cope with a lot of 
dramas in life, including when Duterte became the president, I had to, like, I had to read what? What? and son. So yeah, bro, like, Russian uh, was had a huge part in, in, in my intellectual and cultural imagination. But, but so I understand where you, uh, that your feelings about China is kind of conflicted. Like, I want to be there, but my God, on. so I have that feeling also about Russia right now, right? Um, now, going back to this, obviously, things get a little bit tricky because Cold War comes, you no? Know? And things get even trickier when Stalin dies, speaking of Russia, and then Mao Zedong becomes the big boy or the big brother of the communist world and tries to exert influence in the post-colonial world. So I, there's a fascinating book, the you know, like Global Maoism or something like that. Uh, like, Mao, love, Mao, right? Yeah, fascinating, right? Uh, it, it really changed my perspective. Of how, I didn't know Mao was that ambitious. I knew he was kind of crazy, but wow. Like, well, from Africa to Latin America, he was competing, right? Against mm-hmm. Soviets, not against US. He was competing against Russians, right? Uh, because he was he, supposedly he was angry with the you know, desalinization and all. But I know it was all about his ego. He wanted to be the top man. Uh, and he had reasons to have that ego. Now, obviously, that has direct impact on the Philippines because we suddenly have the founding of a new communist movement in the Philippines, right? Which in many ways is not your Russian style, Leninist, Stalinist one, but it's more like a, a Maoist kind of communism, mm-hmm. right? Now, okay. I just realized we're entering very tricky, tricky territory. Okay, um, let's just have a least crazy version of this part of discussion. So, just without you going into the whole, you know what I'm saying, right? Um, just tell us a little bit about how influential was China into the the uh, the the into the as far as the left in the Philippines is concerned, especially from 1950s, 60s onwards. Well, so sa youth movement talaga naging influential ang Chinese communism, di ba? Because yung, yung idea of the cultural revolution from China, which right. where the youth would be the vanguard of remaking society, right. that, had a lot of, that had a lot of global appeal. Even people who weren't claiming to be communists took right. inspiration from yung kind of youth politics of Maoism. And you saw this nga in, in yung book of Maoism of Global History. Yeah, so even the Black Panthers, for example, are drawing from that. Sure. The weather underground in the United States are also drawing from that. And then, of course, the Philippines, it really begins with the youth group of the original Communist Party of the Philippines, the Partido Comunista ng right. Pilipinas. That youth group was called Kabataang Makabayan. And um, it was headed in the early 60s until the mid-60s by a man named who just passed away, uh, Jose Maria Sison. I don't really want to call him Professor Jose Maria Sison because if I'm not mistaken, he was just an instructor in UP. Um, uh, sorry. Let's sorry. Not into no, let's, 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 not, let's, let's not get into that. Okay. Uh, so 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 Sison actually uh, discovers new currents of Marxism, not because he goes to China, but because he goes to Indonesia. And remember, in the in the yeah, early 60s, exactly. Indonesia is the most developed communist the, party. The third biggest communist party on earth, right? PKI. Yeah, the most development, developed communist party in Asia outside the Chinese Communist Party itself, yeah. headed by a very dynamic leader who who, who read Mao named Dien uh, who kind of diagnosed Indonesia in a very similar way to Sison as kind of right. semi fusion and semi-colonial. So Sison goes back to the Philippines with this theoretical armature, which not, yeah. not a lot of people had. In fact, I talked to his colleagues. He, they, they said na yung advantage to like Nijoma was that he had access to, he had a nexus, if you like. you know, He had yeah, a nexus exactly. of global knowledge that the other people didn't have. And that's what allowed him to ascend into the, theoret- to the theoretical heights of right. the, the youth movement. And eventually, this youth movement, which becomes this illusion with the young, young elders they set up a, an explicitly Maoist Communist Party right. of the Philippines and that is the now the Communist Party that we know today yung CPP Communist Party of the yeah, Philippines yeah. and of course that is the the, the longest standing Maoist um, revolution in the world today right so when Marcos went to China right so we normalize our relations with China during Mar- Marcos visit 1975 if not mistaken right so 1974 Bong Bong with Mommy with Imelda Ghoster. He's very proud of reciting that. And then there's that picture of Mao with Bong Bong. And then the next year, the father goes there. I think like it's a five day state visit. And unlike the Sanya, two day lang yung visit. We'll talk about that shortly. I said, Paka din dad man tagal, liko two days lang, diba? Kasi junior ka lang. I was thinking like, Paka two days lang, alam bilis naman. Kasi marami pa siyang ibang, marami pang kailang ibang puntan si Magellan. Wow. Siya pa yung ano, no? Para sorry. Hindi, five days siya sa Japan, eh. 
tagal niya sa Europe, ang tagal. Oh, Parang okay. lang sa China. We'll talk about that the other one soon, no? But so we we normalize ties. So my understanding is part of that normalization was to tell Maui China not to support the Philippine, uh, you know, yes. the, the, right? And how successful was that based on historical evidence? Was that I mean, ganito naman, ganito naman talaga yung strategy, di ba? Ganyan din yung ginawa sa, Min, ganyan, ganyan din naman sa Mindanao, di ba? Si Imelda pumuntang Libya. They, 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 they had a, they had a way of, of diffusing domestic tension through international trips, right? And, and right. through essentially... Shuttle diplomacy. Yeah. flattering the leaders who could support the the domestic the the kind of yeah. the people they consider to be kind of in quotes domestic terrorists so it's 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 a very it's a very adroit strategy but it looks like du- during that period effectively yes na bumaba rin talaga yung funding ng communist party of the philippines remember right. na merong at merong attempts talaga to bring in chinese arms into the communist party of the philippines early on and one of the reasons why marcos one of the justifications for marcos to declare martial law was yung ano yung nahuli lang mv karagatan which was a ship coming from china with arms from china right, right, right. To provide to the communist party of the philippines um the captain of that that ship was a man named Rolando Peña who became a geologist in UP actually um and uh, and and that that was that was a failed attempt to bring in arms pero nandoon yon and so 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 obviously i think yung MV Caragatan experience at least for the Marcos administration right. talagang that that freaked them out a little bit and yes. and that probably informed itong charm charm offensive against china and yeah. then of course um ideologically from within the dfa you really had advocates already of kind of normalization of ties with at that time what was called red china diba um right. and the, the advocate for that i think if i'm not mistaken was really carlos p p romulo and then of course he brags surprise, in his surprise. memoirs he brags in his memoirs that He brags a lot. Philippines, uh, he said, mayabang na tao. Uh, he was a funny guy, pero mayabang. Hey, Nero, di ba? Yung bragging, you know, Nero was like, I warned Nero about, you know, the, oh. you know, like, and he was so happy because of, I, he called him General Romulo or something like that. Like, oh, General Romulo. This guy is, he's so influencer, right? If if he had YouTube channel and all, this guy would have been the Joe I mean, God, uh, God, God, Carlos Romulo YouTube or Carlos Romulo TikTok would have been amazing. And that guy would have been the guy. His podcast would be, I mean, oh. we're all even out of business if that guy was the podcast. Oh. So, Saka nakakatawa raw siya. Nakakatawa siya eh. Yeah, 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 must be. Yeah, yeah, smart kasi. Yeah, uh-huh. We be smart. Uh-huh. I didn't know that. Pero tsaka self-deprecating yung humor. You know, the humor of parang uh, a short person who knew who yeah, was short. Yeah. Was, unayin, yeah. ko na, unayin ko na before uh-huh. you try to, yeah, very... So now, obviously, then shopping comes in relations. So wait, like, sorry, tapos yeah, sorry, about yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So Romulo brags na dahil oh. daw sa kanya na Nixon normalizes ties to China. Kasi inunahan daw nila ni Marcos. And when they when, when Marcos saw that Romulo and Marcos had pulled it off, Nixon was like, oh, okay, I I I I follow. So I, I don't natin know. Yan. Philippines was also <laughs> ending. But I have a version of email that everything with Mao, Mao ended the Cold War or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> This is fascinating. This is a credit grabbing so, competition, right? So, hindi ko alam yung pagiging central ng Philippines sa world history. Ano ba? Nagdaya natin number five. By virtue of kahambugan of people, yeah. of people like uh, CPR, Carl Spiro Molo. Oh, my admire, but he was a really arrogant person. I mean, I, I mean, he has his own version of Nixon, I, of Wolfie probably, no? Kay Wolfowitz. If he has, probably has also a picture of whispering to, I don't know, Nixon, Kissinger and telling Kissinger, go to, and meet Joe and Lai or something like that, no? This is interesting. This one, I'm not sure I, I can cite it as credibly, but it's worth discussing as a potential number five of Philippines at the forefront or at the at the interstices and nexus of, uh, of, of uh, America's global imperial project. Now, sorry if I have to push ahead because I mean we can talk a lot about Arroyo, Ramos, etc. No, let's talk about Ramos because uh, this is what happens, right? The Americans leave in 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 1992, effectively, right? First of all, what was going on there? Because I want to ask your opinion. Because on one hand, we have this uh, narrative that we kicked out the Americans with the Senate vote and all, but actually, if you research it, it's like the Americans already wanted to leave. Especially after the major earthquake that affected me also personally, right? Uh, exactly. So the volcano and then the earthquake. Is, so the Americans were saying like, "Sobrang sira na tong area na to and volcano. Like we just want to get out of this area, right? So for them, it really didn't make sense to stay. So it's not really our Senate kicking them out. It was them really not that interested. So eventually, negotiations over basis extension. 
we're not going forward because Americans didn't want to cough up more money. They just didn't see the value. In fact, the term they used was peace dividend, right? Which is, we're spending so much. Italo na ang Soviet Union, but patay gagastos. It doesn't make sense anymore. So George Senior, uh, George W. Bush, uh, George Bush Senior, his idea was like, let's let's try to extricate ourselves, no, uh, and 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 have a different strategy. So, what is your take on that? What was really going on there? Ah, uh, actually, bag bag ko ngayon wala na rin again, but th- th- that's a very fascinating fascinating insight. And ang ang reaction ko yan, itatay ko dun sa sinabi mo kanina is. Right. Maybe the United States didn't know at that time when what the real Cold War was because they ah, didn't going realize back to what it says, yeah, the China was the coming. Importance of Asia. Yeah, now, right. one wonders, no, if right. they knew what would happen 30 years later, would they have so easily abandoned those bases? Diba? Lalo na kung alam nila na magiging right. focal point of global tensions actually ang, ang Pacific. You That's think a, they could have done it? Sorry, you think the Americans could have forced the case on the uh, on the Philippine post war You think baka mahirap na, baka mahirap na. I mean, right. um at that time yung 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 domestic atmosphere sa Pilipinas, of course you had the left okay. advocating. Matagal na nag-advocate yung left against the bases. But the interesting thing about the bases getting kicked out was that it had already filtered into mainstream nationalist politics. Exactly. Like, of course, Era Estrada yeah, being yeah. one of the key figures in kicking yeah. out the bases. And then uh, Gideon Lasco actually was telling me na actually, one of the reasons why people wanted to kick out the bases kasi may AIDS scare na raw nung time na yon. Oh, and so there was a politics oh, now of AIDS. Right, right. 80s. Informing, kasi, the, yeah, 80s oh, informing the kicking out of the bases. So that, that's, a, that's a kind of fascinating angle that um, Gideon's looking into. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, the medical... Geopolitical uh, aspect. Uh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, like paranoia can play a big role. And and I don't know if your era probably these things play a big role in your decision making on geopolitics. I say, I am policy na natin. I mean, <laughs> especially when mayor kind of thinking of people. Now, so the reason I want to mention Ramos is because the mischief reef incident happens very shortly after Americans leave. No, in fact, I had the back and forth with Teddy Casino uh on Twitter about this issue, like you know, like oh, you think you can just persuade China by being nice to them and all? Like, clearly they're opportunistic. I'm talking about communist regime in China. They're opportunistic. The moment they they sense weakness, the moment the Americans left, they, they went for it, right? So within two years, Mischief Reef was, wala, gone, diba? Um, So that should have what been... What do you think was the calculation China. about that time? Talagang ano, pinaghandaan nila? The Chinese? Na- yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh-huh. they're always like that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, they follow very closely everything like that. So my understanding is like that, eh. But this is also the era of karaoke diplomacy. You know, Ramos trying to uh, sing with, you know, with uh, uh, with Jiang Zemin and try to charm them. But clearly, Ramos was smart enough to realize the bilateral diplomacy has limits. You still have to have leverage. That's why he pu- pushed for AFP modernization. He pushed for VFA. I, I don't think Ramos was, you know, super gung on. And also ASEAN diplomacy. But he realized each of these had their limits. So he had to do all of them at the same time, right? So for me, that's why Ramos had the most uh, sophisticated approach which I called bi multilateralist bilaterally deal with China, but also multilaterally try to get support from ASEAN, from US, from allies, etc. But anyways, I I think I already covered that. Now, a little bit fast forward tide. Uh, Arroyo comes in and Arroyo, of course, diversifies because she gets bashed a lot by US and Australia for withdrawing our troops in light of saving an OFW from being massacred by the precursor to ISIS. Uh, oh, in, uh, Iraq, but this is Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which later on will be uh, part of the ISIS, the Daesh. Um, so that's where I would say that's the birth of what later on. Because if you look at it, bro, I don't know if you uh, I, you watch probably my interview with Arroyo, right? She o- openly admits that mm. Duterte's foreign policy is not too different from hers. Or like she's, but uh, we know that realistically she's actually the chief advisor on foreign policy on Duterte, right? So we clearly see the embers of what we're seeing, we have seen over the past five, six years. Actually, it goes back to Arroyo era. Actually, now yeah. that you mentioned that, a side yeah. question. Yung, yung increasing closeness ni Bongbong sa US, is this also telling, Is th- does this say about yung the deterioration of the relationships relationship between the Marcoses and the Arroyos? Ah, that's a very interesting thing to look at. Uh, well, I, we're digressing, but papatulan ko yan. Unang-una, I think overestimated yung role ni Arroyo in putting the Duterte Marcos axis or what's what what why did they call themselves Uni Team, right? Uh during that mm-hmm. it was really Martin Romualdez who was really the decisive factor. And we clearly see why. 
now i mean with martin doing a super good job of putting the whole thing together right i think just the other day there was this massive ceremony of all these davao congressmen and all joining la Raza's party of marcos like the detergents are really getting isolated now so and second of course arroyo was not happy when she didn't get the speaker of the house and he went to martin romualdez i think she was really expecting that and now clearly you see Aroy is part of a minority uh, that is still loyal to Duterte. So I think there are like 18, 19 of them who want to protect Duterte from ICC and all. And I said, oh, isn't Duterte so popular and all? Why only 18, right? Didn't have 300 allies in the Congress and all. So you're right. There must be some, some sort of connection going on there. But Marcos Jr. being Marcos Jr., super nice guy, Mr. Congeniality, he still brought Arroyo with him when he went to the China visit and tries to give at least... Arroyo is very influential. He called Arroyo his secret weapon when he went to China. Apparently, the secret weapon didn't work that much, right? Because no major really deal came out. But let me remind... So, yeah, speaking of Arroyo, I think we appreciate her Spanish a lot. Uh, she did some very interesting things. I, honestly, I, I know I'm digressing here, but let hear me out, okay? I'm not saying this because we're related or I call her Tita Roy, but hear me out. Um, so some of the apologies or whatever, some people say Ganito. If you look at Arroyo, she wasn't too bad, was she, when she was in the uh, she, Department of Trade and Industry, when she was a senator, when she was a vice president. She was kind of like the right person. Kaya nga nung Edsa, she was the hero of Edsa Dos, di ba? Uh -huh. The argument is this. Hear me out. Uh, I mean, I know it's, it's very controversial. I never bring it up. But the argument is something like this. Parang, if sana lang that Edsa Dos didn't happen the way it did and and she became normally the next president, meaning Arab finishes term, super unpopular, whatever, and then she gets elected, she would have been actually a very good president. It's mm. the fact that she was thrust into a vortex of a chaotic situation and then you had the constitutional issue on whether she could still run for another time. That's where things really went you know, off the rails. No? So parang the idea is that if only she became the president earlier, if someone would say she could have even, she she would have had a good chance even against Arab had she run right away enough for the presidency in 1980. I'm not, I don't buy that as much, but the idea was that if she just stayed as a senator and then ran for president in 2004, she would have had a very different place in history. Why is this important, bro? Why is this important? Because don't, don't you think it's kind of weird that she's still a congresswoman? She's still around. She's writing, uh, what is it, Deus Ex Machina? You know, don't you think something is going on there? Because my reading of that, bro, uh, I know you tell me what's your my reading of that he, she's looking for a redemption, Parin. A part of her feels that history was unfair to her, that mm -hmm. she was not able to put, to display her best of skills, and somehow she became the victims of the worst of Philippine politics. Again, uh, I know I never wrote about this because I know it's it's so controversial. But I want to talk to a historian about this and tell me about this. I, again, it's a counterfactual that I already discussed with a historian and an economist, political scientist, whatever. I think historians are best to talk about. Tell, you, tell me about it. Right? I know it's, I know it's it's like part of screaming against this, right? Interesting but, in your psychology ni GMA eh, because parang GMA has a chip on her shoulder. Yeah. And she really does want to prove herself. And I was talking to one of her classmates. I don't know if it's from yeah, from assumption ng high school daw. And yeah. GMA daw, kasi yung assumption napaka-alta ng atmosphere. And si GMA, anak siya ng presidente. Pero yung tatay niya, galing sa mahirap eh. Yeah, exactly. Hindi, Very, uh, yeah. Hindi sila Comfort. part of the traditional elite. And yeah, so, exactly. medyo dinamata daw siya ng mga traditional konyo sa assumption. And because of that, GMA daw, like, had a, had, had a certain fire that she wanted to prove herself that, not, not just that she could make it in high society, the high society of assumption, but that she could do better than than right. all of them, right? So, so meron talaga. This is like I think this is a kind of tradition, like classical origin A-type. story, na origin story. Sorry, you you according to our classmate, yun daw talaga that 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 that, that mo, assumption daw really explains the psychology of JMA. Yung kind of hyper alt, and this is you know assumption is alta now, but yeah. in the fifties it was even more it was even more refined. So she became out. overachiever. So if you are an overachiever like her, and she's quite a smart person, I would tell her I'll I'll give her that. Um, then you would really feel bad that you ended up as the most unpopular Filipino president, right? Like she had uh -huh. negative net ratings. I mean, it's insane, right? Her ratings are like if you look at all post Marcos presidents, all of them had like at least a peak. And then a little bit, you know, but they're still keeping a certain level. She's the only one who, like, is there consistently for year after year, negative, net, negative. Look at the net numbers of SWSA. Hindi lang net numbers. She's like a whole class in herself. And 
out mm-hmm. and she served for almost 10 years right so she's she's a she she has occupied a very unusual place in her history and i think from her perspective she, the history was unkind to her or the, the things that turned out because yeah. I don't, hear me out again uh, my sense is if it was ramos then arroyo without Arab in in the middle we could have avoided duterte Interesting. And probably even Aquino. We didn't even need an Aquino. It would have been a totally wala na Aquino. Yeah, kasi wala rin naman Duterte kung walang Aquino, di ba? It's, exactly. It's a complete... So you could... And probably no Marcos Jr. too, right? Like, yeah. for me, Arab is really the reason all of this is happening. Right? Yeah, yung, uh, yung Edsa Tres, which really kind of broke yeah. so many things. Yeah, the, the, yeah. and resentment. He, and, yeah. he reacted to Edsa Tres, yung kind of elitist way he yeah, reacted exactly. to it. Something went so, real off the rails there. The, yeah. the, uh, the thing about Jimmy is, I think, well, she was rubbing against two parang inherent biases of Philippine, ng Philippine electorate. Number one, the Philippine electorate is sexist. And number two, the Philippine electorate doesn't like China, and she was the Against president the, uh, yeah. of us closer to China. And so, mahirap talagang ishore up yung ratings yeah, with those kind of inherent yeah. disadvantages. And then of course, and number you know, three, we hated corruption at least back then a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah yung ZT and everything happens. Yeah, ZT is in in fact a kind of perfect storm because it's like it's it's like there are so many narratives around it, like. Yeah. Number one, you are a woman and you are being you are be you are you're corrupt, but you're doing so because of powerful men around you, like yeah, Mike yeah, Arroyo. Yeah. So it plays into right? all that sexist into all the, the sexist, yeah. sexist narratives. Yeah, Number yeah. two, you're being manipulated by the you're, you're you're participating in the manipulation of evil Chinese, right? Because that's the conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So parang, yeah, it the corruption scandal is bad enough in itself, pero kawawa ka palalo. Mm. Dahil the narratives around it feed into existing biases. And yeah, I, I mean, what is, how do you think in retrospect, Richard, the ZTE, um, a, a big Chinese company, one of the biggest corruption scandals in the history of the Philippines, what, how, how important is that moment in terms of the development of Chinese Filipino relations in the in in in, in you know in, in recent years? Yeah, so interesting. I did a book on WikiLeaks, no? Um <laughs> so I had to go through a lot of cables. You know, one of the things that fascinated me, Lelo, is even the American embassy was impressed by how nice US, Philippine, and China were working out in 2004, 5, 6. So Arroyo goes to China, when Jiabao comes here, like even the Americans were saying. Yeah, maybe they can work it out and we don't get need to get involved. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, look at read the cables to talk, especially when the JMSU and all came out. Even the Americans were kind of saying, who knows? It might work, right? So my sense is China had a golden opportunity to really lock it in long-term good relationship with the Philippines and really go against all the biases against China, Cold War biases against communism, Spanish era prejudice against the Chinese people, etc. And they 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 messed it up, bro. They messed it up. It those corruption cases, not to mention the North Railway project that went off the rack. I, I mean, after it, that tells you China is not that sophisticated because that was really a good chance for them to make inroads in the Philippines. Which brings us to the uh, to the third era, right? Because this becomes once again a big mistake of China. They had a golden opportunity with Duterte, but I think they thought they can have it on the cheap, which is we'll just promise it, do nothing, and then hope the Philippines will be nice to us. Because it's Duterte. Now, 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 Richard, do you think that they the, that they thought they had it on the cheap because they had some sort of other power, some something over Duterte that that has that and, 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 don't, and probably something, intermediaries something, something, yeah, yeah. something that is there a possibility, for example, that they help him get elected? You know, I mean, this is speculation, of course, right. and part, part of this is like the Russian compromise on on Trump, right? Like oh, some oh, oh, in the it, hotel in Moscow. Oh, for me, I think it's more more than that. I mean, for me, I'm sure there are many intermediaries and people, uh, you know, influential people in film and business and politics around the Duterte who gave China an impression that this is locked in. I, I, I even heard from, you know, back in the day, I was arguing that, no, this Duterte thing is not sustainable because the defense establishment in the Philippines, because of public opinion, because nothing is going to come in, etc. And as I said, no, no, this is not, this is it. This is for the good, right? And that person is now in, in this government. So I don't know why they have... In this, in this, ano, tutan ng Amerikano government, in this, 
siya. Yeah, yung uh, weird. Like, ito yung mga believe na believe kayo. Bigla nandun na siya. But anyways, it's a, they put him in a totally irrelevant office as kanyang skill. So, he looks like a fool when he talks about things. But anyway, I don't want to say more. Baka, but anyway, um, so, nah, so if you look at it, China, said they had a second chance under Duterte and they still wasted it because they were they thought they would get it on the chip. So, my sense is they don't have very good ambassadors here. Uh -huh. I have ambassadors here who are sending the wrong signals back to Xi Jinping. You know why, why I believe that? Because look at the face of Xi Jinping when he came here in 2018 in Manila in November. He looked pissed off. Like, I thought they love us and everything is going to get done. We're going to sign a new JMSU and all. And he got nothing. You know what happens? Teddy locks in, goes on Pinky Web's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the show on CNN says, Alam mo yung mga pro-China dyan, pinapasahin kami, ayaw namin yan. Like, can you Xi Jinping? What's going on, dude? This is a mess, right? Like, this country is not really, uh, you know. So, the second day when he met uh, Arroyo and Soto and all, you could see Mukha ni so, ni ano, no, no, so, no, 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 poker face now. Like, what's going on here? They're not, is I thought, matter, is this a matter of bad ambassadors or is this a matter of, you know, classic example of the dictator who doesn't hear bad news because everybody is afraid to so, tell Or everyone them. tries to give him super, super super nice good news so that they get promoted. I, I think the previous yeah. officer got promoted very well, right? We don't have to... I think he was here like six years, seven years. So I think they oversold their influence on Duterte because they forgot that Duterte is not the only player in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Philippines is a messy democracy. The military has influence. The business groups have influence. Media has influence. Civil society has influence. Public opinion has influence. So my my half joke is they thought they got their own sen in the Philippines. Mm. The Philippines is not Cambodia, right? Even if you got your Hunsen, uh, you know, he doesn't control the country, right? And and not to mention, unlike Hunsen, Duterte came a little bit later in his life. So he doesn't have that uh, infiltration through the state institutions that Hunsen had because of his military background, etc. So uh, you know, so that's that's what I'm saying. So I think they got it really wrong, and that set the stage really for for BBM, right? Because my fundamental argument is the Chinese were very optimistic that with BBM they can have con consolidation of what they had with Duterte uh, uh, and they could get things that they couldn't get out of Duterte. <laughs> that's, so funny to, that's so funny to hear now. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's now. hilarious. And, and, and I'm not saying I warned them, but I kind of, you know, with all my writings, I said, no, BBM will be different, right? Will be very different because there were all of these Filipinos uh, experts, writers, whatever. So they would say that if Bong Bong wins, it's end of you know it's going to be China consolidation, blah blah blah. And I was always skeptical of that because you know uh, because of many reasons that I discussed because I don't think Bong 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 is going to be less Tatai, more of his own Tatai, right? More of his own. Well, father, it was, I mean, I guess tatai. from a ele electoral perspective, it was a, also a convenient belief to have, right? That kumanalo yung Manok mo, this is the one who will protect us against China, not this one who actually rehabilitated. Although my understanding, bro, Lelo is uh, Marcus was so dominant in the elections, he didn't need China or anyone. Assuming right. he even, you know, cons he was just so dominant, bro, like 60%. Yeah. I mean, come on. Now, you don't believe it? Look at the approval ratings. If he if he really didn't get 60 50, why is he approval rating 89? You're saying oh, that's also fake? Come on. Google Analytics na lang tayo. Ang ah, ito na naman tayo. Oh my God. Oh. Ayan tayo eh, di ba? Ayan, makakis na naman tayo ng pro Marcos and all. No, but seriously, bro. Um, So, I think Marcos had it so smooth, right? And he just didn't rock the Duterte boat. So, they got, he got it. So, so, he didn't really feel, you know, like something special for it. He was good in talking. Like, oh, in 1974, I was with my mommy and we went uh, Tito Mao. You know? Like, he would always say that. But, he really never felt that affection. His affection is for British underground music, for jazz. Yeah, his affection is, for, yeah, his affection is for his Wharton days and his Oxford days. And he's, he's a totally different kind of political, you know, uh, uh, species, no? From Duterte, who barely visited the United States. And apparently, according to him, he was even rejected from passing through LA, coming back from, I don't know, Colombia or whatever. So he's a totally different. But as I said, bro, I think the decisive factor was, and as, as I said, uh, I wrote in March 2022, three factors will determine how Marcos comes out, right? I call it minimalist uh, Marcos, you know, like, like, you know, middling Marcos and like super. Yeah, I I remember one that. is the, uh, one is how big he'll win because that will give him a sense of destiny. Well, he won't be. Second is, essentially I was saying, will Sarah Duterte dominate him or it will be the other way around? I think we now know the answer, right? Like what Sarah Duterte no, yeah. is doing, right? What did Cayetano say about the office of vice president? And number three, what will the superpowers offer him? So look at what Biden offered him. Offered him the most important thing. Hegel said, 
the struggle for recognition, right? Like this is the Fukuyama. He gave him the recognition, that is the most which is essential to the full rehabilitation of Marcoses. And more than that, U.S. is offering so much more investments, military assurance, and we know when when U.S. comes in, Japan comes in, other countries come in. So, and then what did he get from China? He was there two days, just two days. Uh, he was like, sorry, I have to go to Japan next. Uh, five days, you know. Um. Bro, look at it. There was a strong joint statement. I broke it down in my articles, uh, like six articles. Where, like, you look at it. Nothing on any Chinese project. The only thing they mentioned was like the Davao project and all. Nothing about Clark Railway, High Speed Railway. Nothing about Minda. Like, they didn't even bother to offer him anything. And then on West Philippine Sea, nada. The only thing is we'll have more communication channels as if that helped us during Duterte. He had the best communication channels straight to... I don't know, teaching, but it didn't work, did it? Right? Read bank with Sunrif and also China didn't give him much. US gave him more than he ever expected. So I think that's where he suddenly is all in into it. Remember, so Mark, the US the during election. election. Sorry, I, I, he barely mentioned US during elections because I'll be honest, bro. I think a part of Marcus was worried how US will react to his presidency. Like mm -hmm. court cases, Biden, the Democrat. So I think he was a little bit worried. And then once Biden called him and all like, and then Wendy Sherman comes number two says, oh, you have sovereign immunity, right? Which is what I always said. I said, look at the case of Modi in India. He was banned from entering US once he becomes prime minister, automatically he's welcome US every day, right? So I think that that really affected him. It's like, he feels good. And then of course, around him, he has people like Babe Romualdez, our ambassador to, to Washington, was also his cousin. And Babe Romualdez is a very sound, traditional minded person who believes that we have to make these relations with the with US robots. So we are where we are. Where we are, where we are. Si Manalo, si Manalo, reading mo sa kanya? Manalo is... No offense, ah, no offense. Remember in the British system, they have like a permanent secretary of affairs and then there's a separate foreign affairs guy. So one is more like the administrative, one is more strategic. I think it's kind of like that, no? Uh, no offense. I mean, Manalo was a great ambassador to UN and all. But I think it's more like the permanent secretary, secretary type, you know, in the British system. While our, memory. Big all this are more or less our, you know, our foreign policy architect because he's handling the most important aspect of our foreign relations, which is relationship with the United States. So, so the I'm questioning Leloy is, sorry, I'm talking more because I know you got tired, you talk a lot, is, um, yeah, but, what will China do next? Because huh? what will China do next? Now, the, the, the problem is the ball is in China's court, right? If they bully us more in the West Philippines, see, like the stupid things they're doing now with the laser and all of that, the more my excuse tie to go to the US camp. At the same time, hindi naman pwede na mang-mang lang ang China, di ba? So that's why I said, China should offer something. China should offer something, bro. Uh, and the question is, what are they going to offer him? Yung tanong ko sa'yo, Richard, parang, do you think the die is cast? More or less, ito na yun. Ito na yung Marcosian foreign policy. Uh, you... Yes and no. Yes, in a sense, I think there could be a sustainable long-term trajectory. Pero kaya, kaya ng, gaya ng Dennis Cusco with parang Lord De Vera, among others, pwede na may dribble yan eh. Like, for instance, ilan... Il how big are going to be the exercises with the U.S.? Which basis will really be given to them? Because there are many bases in Isabela and all. Or you can give as far north as Mavulis and Fuga, which is almost Taiwan. Or you could be somewhere a little bit there in mainland Isabela, some whatever place. Sabi mo nga, you don't think it will aabot na Mavulis. That's what the My sense is Mavulis will be only open kung may gyera na at namamatay na yung American troops. Kasi ano klaseng aliado? Eh, namamatay na. Eh, parang sorry, asarado kami ngayon. Neutral kami. You cannot do that. Uh, katulad ng sinabi ng kaibigan si Greg, Greg Pauling who, who uh, you know oversees the AMTI CSIS project in Washington he said that the moment that happens the alliance is dead the moment the Philippines says I'm neutral then there are American troops dying there they're having it's, it's done and we know all the war games are saying the invasion will come from the south so ang lapit na to sa Mavulis eh, literally the Chinese warships will pass nearby right or maybe they'll bomb it ahead right so ngayon pa lang, you have to prepare it pero my sense is full opening will be only in a contingency situation but preparations can already but happen. It will happen. But it will happen. Parang you have no doubt na bubuks, kung magkaroon ng gera, bubuksan niya ang mabulis na yan to the Americans. I think the Americans will really stomp down the boots like, dude, you want to be on your own now with China now invading Taiwan or you want to be with us and maybe have a chance of it? Put yourself in, let's say you're a Philippine president. Yeah, right? no choice, China is no invading choice. Taiwan. You want to be neighbor with Taiwan, with China right now? I mean, like, uh, seriously, right? Or you want to take your chances and maybe with U.S. you can actually prevent the invasion from succeeding, right? You know, mm -hmm. for me, what's happening in Ukraine is influential, right? Because it showed us 
you can actually beat Soviet style militaries yes. well. Yes. Taiwan is 10 times more advanced than Ukraine. And if it Speaking has which, huh? Yeah, may hirap, may hirap pa talaga China diyan. May hirap pa talaga China. Speaking of which, but the Bongbong Marcos didn't want to really talk about Zelensky or or Ukraine early on, pero ngayon nag-talk na so, phone call with Zelensky and Mr. Lelo, I have a suspicion of his bravery. This is where I have a suspicion. And of course, I got also uh, the attack a lot for giving kudos to that because the only missing piece was that. Eh. Because we supported, we supported the Ukraine through and through, right? We supported them in General Assembly. We supported them when kicking out Russia from the Human Rights Council, etc. UN Human Rights Council. So, uh, yun lang missing piece. So, you know what? Tama yan, right? And then we saw some Dilaw friends and all attacking like, oh, like, Oh, he just said wishing you the best. No, bro. I mean, come on. He went to Ang the next one. Ang lang yun, pinatos ka pa rin nun. Yo, bro, for bro. that. Yeah, bro. parang I'm OA daw. Anyway, just to uh, end on this point, because we still have to discuss Japan, but very shortly, sorry to our Japanese friends. Um, Or maybe next time. No, I mean, the next thing is... um, Japan. Yeah, it's China, I think. I'm, I'm going to have to do something very Japanese. Yeah, I know, man. It's always 3 a.m. Like, I have a, you know, a jujitsu jiu class. I know, class. Oh, So... So so let's do the Japanese episode hopefully in the near future. Uh I'm sure Japan will be always exciting. No, and speaking of this, diba? Um for me pwede natin pa rin i-dribble 'yan, 'di ba? And, 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 and no, speaking of uh, of Ukraine and all, no, I, I'm saying what happened because remember the Chinese military technology is a derivative of Soviet technology which is where the Russian technology comes. So if they're doing so bad in Ukraine, forget about invading Taiwan which is amphibious and 10 times more advanced. So, in short, Marcos understands a basic word that yeah. the other side doesn't seem to understand, which is called deterrence. This is mm. all about deterrence. Again, as the Roman uh, you know, the, the proverb goes, if you want peace, prepare for war. Because if you're prepared, you're not going to be invaded. It's only when no. you're unprepared and no. weak that you get invaded. As simple as that. And the Japanese, of course, we speaking of the Japanese, the Japanese. No, like you think it when I Japan for the sake of it. Nakala, <laughs> ito yung pinakala ng mga Japanese about about the Chinese. So, so even if, for example, yung capacity nila to develop a military is limited, yung capacity nila to 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 develop technology and yeah. surveillance technology that can hem in the Chinese, yeah. it's it's something that they, they that they've really relied on over the years. And I must say, you know, I suspect that the Japanese, even though mas maliit yung army nila, mas maliit yung forces sila, they're probably technologically superior to the Chinese. Oh yeah, that, they, have, that... they still have the best navy in Asia. And by the way, Japan is going to double its defense spending thanks to China. Uh, mm -hmm. and So that's $300 billion over the next five years of additional spending. And Japan has very high-tech uh, uh, counter-strike capability. So uh, everyone forgets about Ch Ch Japan. Japan is still the world's third largest economy, right? And it has the most advanced armed forces in Asia, at least. So that's why I thought maybe we have to have an episode on Japan because it's also a very complex uh, mm -hmm. and interesting, fascinating uh, relationship, especially because now Japan wants to also negotiate a visiting forces agreement with the Philippines. So hopefully in the next episode, we can go down into the weeds and discuss also Japan because it's a country I think all of us love in one way or another. But we also yes. have a very complicated history with them, unfortunately. Yeah. We adore, I mean, I, I feel like un, 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 unadulterated ang love ng Filipinos for Japan. Eh, right? Japan is so parang, that's right, yeah. It, it's, it's in fact the opposite of yung China, yung nagulat si Xi Jinping at how much they didn't like him. Nung dumating yung emperor ng Japan sa Pilipinas, yeah. nagulat, naman, nagulat naman siya at how, how much he liked me, yeah. Bro, no Say, naman, I, I was having conversation with actually yeah. Japanese diplomats and they asked me, you know, delikado ba na pumunta yung emperor dito sa Manila? Sabi ko, hindi. Kasi yeah. sabi nila, the emperor is worried. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, two emperors. Don't be worried at all, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. loves you. Worried, no, worried about being like BTS, you know, like BTS. Oh, baka, <laughs> fandom pa, baka fandom pa ang concern exactly. mo, di ba? Exactly. And bata pa, medyo reti bata tong emperor. No, I mean, uh, the, uh, ending on this point, I mean, uh, I remember World Cup, Philippines were cheering for Japan. Like Japan was almost like the Philippine. It was like the team of Asia, right? We were super excited for Japan. I'm like, I'm like, I was, I'm a big fan of Japanese football, right? Super, I was behind it. And then when when we had the World Cup here, male World Cup volleyball, we were all, like the Japanese team in Manila was like the home team, and they mm. got to beat like all this Maputina team na malalakas, no? Like so. Like crazy, like so. I, sometimes, parang pag clickbait. Lagay ko lang yung map ng Japan, ay ng flag ng Japan and the heart and Philippines and dami reaction. Like, like it's it's so like visceral, right? And of course, it's shocking to some people. Like, 
the Japanese did a lot of crazy things, right? Yes, but you know, we're talking about Japan after Second World War, which mm -hmm. really did a lot in the Philippines, including it made us host of the Asian Development Bank, the biggest financial institution in Asia, Ooh. which I think is people forget, right? ADB is here in Manila, right? Not in Seoul, not in Singapore. It's here in Manila. It's one reason why Manila can still have a claim to being a global city, right? Yeah. Ways that Hanoi cannot make or Jakarta or some of the other major cities yeah. in the region but cannot Jakarta, yeah. Jakarta has ASEAN. Yeah, but Jakarta has yeah. ASEAN and all of that. I'll give it to them. But the ADB is just really something, right? Okay, so, yeah. so, so I mean, I think this is a good place to, to conclude, bro, no? Because the reason why we love Japan and the reason why, you know, if if the if the statistics, if the numbers still hold true, we love the U.S. more than the U.S. loves itself. Part of that is the history, but part of that is this looming realization talaga that imperial power, that the threat is, is China. And... Uh, I, I want to give Filipinos credit for that, but I also want to criticize Filipinos a little bit for that because I think right. part of the realization that China is a threat is a, 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 a function of the fact that Filipinos are paying attention to geopolitics. But right. that a lot of that right. is still racism. Right. And um, right. if I may, just like as a final thought um, for me, I don't know what your final thought is, but my, my kind of final thought is, Ang kailangan, speaking of dribbling, ang kailangan natin i-dribble dito is yung on the one hand, a commitment to, to, to opposing Chinese imperialism and opposing yung kind of encroachment on China on, on our sovereignty and also opposing the system in China. The, the, the yeah, real it's also the system. Yeah, it's the system, system in China, yeah. the totalitarian system in China that's created concentration camps in Xinjiang. You know, having a kind of clear idea. Of course, of, Tibet. We don't talk about Tibet that much anymore, but Tibet, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean... Ugh. Having a clear idea of the threat that this nation state poses to the world, not just to the Philippines, but but but, but making sure that that does not become xenophobia, because yeah, that is exactly. of course, that's of course the biggest problem that this has yeah, created. Unfortunately, course, unfortunately, yeah. I I I I I won't. I want to name these people, the people who have turned the concern against the Chinese state into a Super concern wrong. against. Yeah. Loyalty of Chinese Filipinos, right. in Super particular, this is so Manong Frank is and also Maring Winnie Bunsod, who wrote a series I, of yeah, I agree racist, this guy does, yeah, racist I agree. articles that she should still be held accountable for. I mean, these, people, for yeah. these are they, they should apologize for it. Manong can't anymore, but these the, these positions have no have they should not be entertained. In, in the public sphere of, of the Philippines, yeah. especially since you have Chinois who are so loyal to our country, who love our country, who contribute a lot of our country, not just economically. Yeah, paterno. I mean, it goes on and on and on. All of these illustrators we had, a lot of them had, were Chin Chinois. For Winnie Monsod, for example, to question the loyalty of a, tesi, of a Teresita Angsi, who is one of our great cultural ambassadors. I mean, you know, it it it's... It's really sick. That's, it was that's, really that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, 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 we are on the same page as back then, right? We were both on inquiry. Uh -huh. I criticized her on the same page. I said, no, I have to call this out. You know, on the same page as inquiry. In fact, I started with Edward Said and Orientalism and accused her of Orientalizing China, essentially, right? Uh, but that's it. Eh? No one is calling out because she's the hero of the opposition against Duterte and now Marcos, right? So I don't know. For me, again, uh, let me also end on this point. Now, on my side, I am not against cooperation with China. I think we can have a credibly fruitful relationship with China, but from a position of strength. And mm -hmm. that position of strength will not come locally yet because we have still to we still need to build up our defensive capabilities to have what you call. Uh, credible defense posture, right? To be like a porcupine or a poison shrimp that, that will make China think twice. Until then, and this is what I told Teddy Casino, it's not mutually exclusive. While we're developing that, we have to also have robust networks of alliances, not just one country, but multiple allies. And this is what we are working on. And you can do both of them at the same time. For me, of course, the, the traditional nationalist in me is not comfortable with foreign troops entering our soil, etc. Uh, what I would uh, add though here is let's see how Marcos will leverage Etka to push for America to give us real advanced weapons because we never got real fighter jets from America. I mean, you, if you watch Top Gun, they call F-18 fighters um, 
like dinosaurs, right? And we don't even have F-15 fighters, not even F-14 fighters, which was called a museum, right? A piece of museum doing sa Top Gun. So like I was watching Top Gun and say like, so what are we going to feel in the <laughs> film? We don't even have F-14 and 18. Forget about the fifth generation fighters, right? The Su-57, whatever. I mean, I'm a big fan of fighter jets, right? I have all of these collections and also like, Like oh my god! Like, sana naman, de ba? We get something out of our relationship with the U.S. If if if, and asana hindi lang real estate relationship ito. But again, uh, deep inside, I'm just completely uncomfortable with relying on any foreign powers. At the same time, we're dealing with the reality of an encroachment into our waters, and it's gonna take 10 years before we develop the minimum creative and defense posture. So, what do you do in the me- in meantime? This is where I disagree with the tactic and seniors of this word. Hindi mo lang makausap. That's the argument of Marcos. You know, one of the weirdest things for me, bro, is when I was watching the SMNI debates during presidential elections, parang Marcos line and Kalodi's line on China, parang, can you tell me the difference again? You're like, sometimes, like, kausapin na lang natin, let's just be nice to ASEAN, except Bong Bong will completely turn, right? Once he's in power, like, he goes, forget about, you know, he goes, Ramos Pinoy almost right there's a bringing the Americans up. oh my god oh parang noy noy Edgar is a Pinoy legacy so oh. Marcos he expanded the Pinoy legacy isn't that like wow only in the Philippines talaga mangyari yan so we end this Nexus episode on actually no. like exceptionalism <laughs> so that's a geopolitics I would say I know no country on earth bro you know me I love all I study all the world but I cannot find a single country as wild as us in terms of foreign policy in only six, seven years. Like how from 2015 to 2023, like it's it's like analyzing three different countries in three <laughs> continents. Three, like it's one is like in North Pole, one is like in South America, one is in South Saharan. It's so insane, bro. But this is where I think we're really exceptional. So I'm going to go against the spirit of our next and say, no, talaga exceptional talaga Filipino. Eh. Thanks, bro. <laughs> The uh, tourism slogan natin, uh, the Philippines, it's just a strange place. Yeah, but a beautiful place and we love it and that's why we do this episode. So thank you so much to everyone who's followed. Actually, the uh, phone ko dito sa side na off na, ang tagal natin. I think we did, wow, I think we, we, we've we been here many, many hours, right? I'll just put it that way. No, So this is, I think, our new record. It just tells us how, I mean, it's 3 a.m. here, but I'm 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 so excited the reason i was having hatching and all is because that means i'm my body's weak now immunity is weak because okay. I'm tired. but you can see yeah. my parang the mind wants but the body <laughs> can't right so i'm gonna like parang medyo may pagalenin mo like the mind goes you know no um so thank you so much bro i really appreciate it i hope we can catch up again so this is uh our latest episode and we discussed the philippines relationship with uh our ex beshi because this was beshi of tatay digong but not beshi of Magellan, I'm Marcus Jr., right? All right. Thank you very much, bro. Talk to you soon. Let's talk about Japan and yeah. so much more. Uh, speaking of Marcus Jr., he's going to visit U.S. soon, so we have to talk about that. And uh, I heard also Elisi Palace, you know, he's going to go to Paris. <laughs> oh, la la. So there's going to be Macron, Marcos, Sandro, Poshy Posh. I call it Posh Diplomacy, right? I mean, oh. he's so posh, right? When he goes to New York and Davos, he loves it. No Posh Diplomacy. Kaya siguro two days lang siya sa Beijing. Oh. Kasi wala siyang favorite hotels doon. <laughs> Nachipan like... Nachi ba siya doon? Oh. <laughs> no, no, no food. Masyado daw no food for him. No hotel lang yata siya. <laughs> Sige bro. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Enjoy yeah, your day. Yeah. And everything. Yeah, bro. Walang may heat now. Bye-bye.